The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and thank you for joining me today for today's webinar. Uh, I am Brad Weeks with Elk Products, and today we're going to talk about the Elk M1 system, how we feel like it's the solution for serious security installers and automation professionals. Uh, first of all, a little background, Elk Products. Uh, we just celebrated our 25th year in business. The Elk M1 system has been available now since approximately 2004. We've done a lot of enhancements over the years to the product line, added some new features, some new integration partners and so forth. So uh, now today's presentation is focused on the M1 system and you should have your go to meeting questions pane there. If you have any questions, please type those in. We'll try to get to those as we go along. So to get started today, we are going to talk about the M1 system and what makes Elk different from, from other manufacturers. Well, we feel like we created a very high quality product. A lot of our products uh, in our product line, like I said, we've been in business for 25 years. We make a lot of accessories for the security and low voltage industry. A number of our products carry limited lifetime warranties. Our M1 system carries a two-year warranty, so we feel like we give better warranties and better products to our installers. The people, when you contact us here at Elk Products in uh, Conley Springs, North Carolina, you should get a live operator and, uh, and our tech support team. There are five of us in the tech support team, and our hours are Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 6.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're very proud that we have won several awards over the years for our tech support and our customer service. Very, very proud of that and our team here. So when you call in, like I said, you live operator, prompt service, little to no hold time. We feel like we've created a system that is very powerful, flexible, and intelligent. The M1 security and automation controller, we feel is that ideal combination for uh, security, access control, energy management, being able to integrate a control solution for comfort, convenience, and simplicity. Our system's been used in a number of different applications over the years, not just residential. What makes the M1 system different? Well, our engineering team, uh, I'm gonna give, a, give away their ages a little bit. They've been, in, they've been doing this for a number of years. So, we have a, a lot of background in security, property, uh, securing property and, and, and life safety and so forth. But we also put a lot of emphasis on being able to incorporate high levels of encryption, multi levels of authentication in our processors, our controls, our communicators, and our wireless devices. We've tried to keep the M1 flexible, allowing the integrators. Uh, to be able to select from partner manufacturers in order to create that, that truly customized control solution for home and businesses. We're very fortunate that we've been able to integrate with, with well over 30 different partner manufacturers for lighting, climate, access, things of that nature. Keeping the system expandable, scalable to fit, to fit the different applications with large zone capacity, both hardwired and wireless as well as keeping it easy to program uh, through our keypad programming, which is an English text programming language. Our software, the Elk RP2 software, makes programming really simple, but still gives you a very powerful software in the rule engine and the things that the M1 can do to create that customization and that automation and so forth, as well as giving remote control access to the system through, through apps and so forth, which for the most part, there are no recurring monthly fees associated with the apps. So the M1 control offers the strength and flexibility needed in a variety of applications. Like I mentioned earlier, think beyond residential in some of the things that the M1 is capable of. I mean, we've had our system, uh, obviously security, uh, one of our top priorities, so residential, uh, commercial, and so forth. But still being able to integrate with uh, fitness centers, restaurants, municipal buildings, food services, just a variety of different applications that the M1 has been used in over the years. 
And we're going to talk about the main board. This is the M1 Gold or M1G or just simply the M1. It goes by several different names. It's still the same platform. It's the M1, our cross-platform control. And the reason we call it a cross-platform control, rock-solid security, but it also gives you that step or that bridge into automation. There are 16 onboard zones. It's expandable up to 208. Of that 208, 144 of those can be wireless. There are 13 onboard outputs, expandable up to 205. We have a 500-word voice vocabulary built into the M1 system. Any zone, hardwired or wireless, can have a six-word phrase associated with the zone. We have optional two-way listen-in for alarm verification. We can support up to 199 users, eight areas, six different arming levels. We have a 512 history event log and a built-in astronomical clock. As far as our keypads and our arming stations, this is what we currently offer in our product line. You can have up to 16 keypads connected to an M1 system and you can mix and match between the ones we have shown here. The first one that we offered was the M1KP. It's the bigger keypad with the green display. We also have the M1KPB for the blue display. Next was the M1KP2, then the M1KP3. These are basically the same two keypads with uh, just a different housing, a different look to them. We have our M1KP nav, which is our three and a half inch color touchscreen. And then we have our M1KPAS. This is our arming station, fits into a single gang outlet box. Got a comparison chart for the keypads. Uh, we won't go over each and all the features, but a couple that I do like to point out is the fact that with the exception of the arming station, each keypad has a zone input built into the wiring harness. Each keypad has a programmable voltage output from the wiring harness. Depending on the keypad, you can have uh, internal or external proximity readers. The two bigger keypads, the KP and the KPB, they have internal temperature sensors. Now these temperature sensors can monitor the ambient temperature around the keypad. Uh, say, for instance, in a vacation home or something along those lines where we can monitor that temperature and have it displayed on the apps if the homeowner would like to simply know what the ambient temperature is there. They can, they can log in with the app to see that temperature and the different mounting options for our keypads. For the most part, surface mount with the exception of the M1 KP2, which can be flush mounted using an optional back box we have. It's, it's like an old work style back box. It allows that keypad to be flush mounted. And then our arming station fits into a single gang electrical box. The voice capability of the M1 system, like I said, it's a 500 word voice vocabulary. You also have the option to custom record 10 six second messages directly into an M1. The way we do that, we use a house telephone as a microphone, and then through a few keystrokes on the keypad, you can create your own custom messages. Uh, these messages can be used as uh, alerts for zones, when zones open and close. It can be used for arm status, even enunciate temperature, trouble condition. You can set up reminders using an M1 in the voice to alert when something needs to happen at a certain time of the day. Our voice dialer, the M1, has the capability of having eight telephone numbers programmed into the system. For the most part, I would say the first two would be your central station, especially if you have standard hardwired uh, POTS line. The first two would be your central station, primary and a backup. Then you can configure the other ones to, to call yourself, call your cell phone, call your neighbor to give them a predefined voice message to alert them that something has happened at your home. We also have remote control capabilities over the phone. You can use a house phone as a keypad, for instance, 
you can pick up a house phone, dial star, 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 or star, zero, star, in order to access the voice prompts of the M1, at which point you can arm and disarm the system, check on zones, check the control outputs, control tasks, and so forth. You can dial into the system remotely as well and access these voice prompts. Now, this does require standard POTS line for the capability of being calling in over the phone line, but once once you're um, connected to the system, like I said, you can arm, you can disarm, you can check statuses, activate tasks, even use the two-way listen-in feature of the M1 system. Our system has access control capabilities. Now, we're not a full-blown access control system. I like to call it access light. We can support up to 16 doors. We can, have, we can support up to 199 users, which can be cards, fobs, or codes. The readers connect to our keypad or to our access control module, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. We've, uh, we feel like this is, uh, you know, for a commercial solution, for employee entrance, gate control, or being able to restrict access by area or partition. For a residential solution, certainly gate control or being able to create uh, temporary users. Now, we're very fortunate that we've been able to integrate with a partner manufacturer called Connect One. Now, Connect One has really been able to enhance the access control capabilities of an M1. They have the, the capability through their automation software to network multiple M1s together, up to 30. They also have the capability of increasing the user base from 199 up to nearly 10,000. They have capability for enhanced emails, uh, temperature logging, and so forth. One other feature they have, it's a very neat feature, is called Scan Pass. And with Scan Pass, no need for a reader at the door. You have a barcode sticker that you can mount near the door, and then through their app, and the, through their app, you can scan at the barcode, and then that gives you the access into the facility. Now, Connect One, like I said, is a partner manufacturer. It's part of our M1 cloud service. Their automation software uh, does require a monthly service charge for their automation software. But if you ever have those larger installations, maybe a campus or a large manufacturing facility, or simply need some of those enhanced features, certainly Connect One would be an excellent choice for that application. Our system is expandable. We have different expansion options available. Our data bus, for instance, there are actually three ways to wire for the M1 data bus. We offer output expansion modules, our access control module, our hardwired expansion module, and a wireless expansion option. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the wireless here in a, in a couple minutes. Elk, we feel like the M1 would be the integrator's choice because of the uh, enhanced encryption capabilities we've, we've been developed into our processor and the M1, our wireless and so forth, giving you the, uh, the ability to select between industry leading manufacturers for your, to meet your customers' needs, as well as uh, you know, the, the budget and so forth. With the exception of Connect One, no, no costly cloud services are required and providing an easy installation and programming, hopefully saving you, the installer, time and money. What are some things that can be integrated with an M1? Well, security and life safety, one of our top priorities, that's the backbone of Elk products, that's where we originally um, originated from, but certainly being able to do access control, lights, fans, thermostats, window coverings, garage doors, Water heaters, both we have a solution for electric and gas water heaters. Water shutoff, sprinkler control, pumps, certainly anything electrical that can be controlled through a relay or through an integration partner appliance module. Certainly the M1 should have some means to be able to integrate with that device. Now, speaking of lighting and thermostat integration, we have several different solutions to select from. These are just a couple that uh, we put together for today's presentation, but if you'd like to see a full list, please visit our website at elkproducts.com 
on the home page, click about and then integration partners. But uh, just to talk about a couple of these, for instance, the Z-Wave integration. We have our M1XSLZW. This is our Z-Wave interface that talks to the Leventon VRCOP module. And through this integration, this allows you to do Z-Wave lights, thermostats, and locks. We have a Lutron integration interface that works with both the Radio RAW 2 for lights, thermostats, and shades. The Homeworks QS for lights, shades, and thermostats, and then Caseta interface for Caseta lighting and shades. We work with UPB lighting and Insteon lighting, uh, several different interfaces there to, to be able to integrate with those two manufacturers. And like I said, this is just a small list. You can visit our website to get the complete list of, of integration options. And then we also do hardwired thermostat integration through our M1 XSP, which allows you to work with the April layer, the carrier, the RCS, and the Leventon thermostats. We'd like to talk about our C1M1 for a second. This is our dual path communicator. This is a super fast, full data communicator over IP and cellular to your central station. This C1M1 significantly reduces transmission time. There's no dial capture, no data bus decoding, which can lead to those delays, no cloud server involved. Auto detects the best path. If one path happens to go down, say the, the internet should go down, the C1M1 would send a signal to your central station to let them know one pathway is down, but I just sent you a signal over the other path letting you know I'm still up and running, I'm still communicating. Great peace of mind there. Also, uh, when it does a communication test signal, if you do it daily, weekly, monthly, uh, whatever you decide, it tests both pathways at that time. So Central Station gets two communications, letting them know both pathways are up and running. The remote access capability, no more port forwarding or extra fees. The connection to the C1M1 is done through the ELK proxy which allows you to do programming with the RP software. We also have a number of different apps available. We have uh, Elklink Mobile, eKeypad, M1 Touch Pro, and so forth. Now, the cellular backbone of a C1M1 is provided by Telgard. So in order to use the C1M1, you would need to have a Telgard account, and they, provide, they do the billing for the cellular services for the system. Now the other option to connect the M1 to the local area network would be the M1XEP. So we have the C1M1 or the XEP module in order to connect an M1 system to the local area network or access them from remotely through the internet. Now uh, the XEP module, uh, in order to to communicate outside of the local area network, you would need to port forward port 2601, and you would need to know what the public IP address is, but the, the XEP also has URL updating to support dynamic DNS providers, also has a national time server uh, sync feature, and it can communicate with your central monitoring service as long as they have the SureGuard 3 or the Osborne Hoffman receiver. Two different options for us connecting an M1 system to the local area network or accessing it through the internet. Take just a minute to talk about the apps that are available. Uh, Elk Link Mobile, for instance, is a free mobile app available for the Android and the iOS platform. That is supported with the, through the C1M1 only. Now this app, very basic, it's ARM, disarm, and uh, uh, acknowledgement of alarms, very basic app. We also have m one to go which is our PC-based software. That works with the XEP module. It can be loaded onto a PC, or you can load it onto a thumb drive to take it from location to location. An integration partner of ours has created eKeypad for the iPhone, the iPad, and the iPod. Uh, one time, charge for the app. It is supported through the C1M1 and the XEP, so it'll work with both. 
Next, we have M1 Touch Pro for the Android devices, one-time charge for the app, it is supported by the C1, M1, and the XEP module. So if the customer needs just a very basic app and you have the C1, M1, Elk Link will work fine. But if they need a more integrated solution where they need to, to arm, disarm, control lighting, control thermostats, and so forth, then I would suggest eKeypad or M1 Touch Pro. And lastly, we have Connect One. They too also have uh, an app available. It does require the monthly service charge for their automation software. It is supported through the XEP module. I think I jumped ahead of myself, and uh, I think we've covered covered that. Let me. Okay, I'd like to tell you about a product that we offer called the Elk. SWV2. This is our water shutoff, uh, shutoff valve to help guard against water damage. As some have uh, probably know that uh, water damage is one of the most frequent insurance claims and if we could do something to help prevent that, the water shutoff valve would be a great addition to an M1 system or to any system or it can be even used in a standalone application. Uh, it's a very simple connection. It's, it operates off 12 volt DC. It's an easy four wire hookup. It opens and closes with under four seconds and it has a manual override lever. So basically you would want to use it with a Form C relay and a controller like the M1 system so that when you arm to the away mode, turn the water off, or when a leak is detected, turn the water off, or it can be used with a simple toggle switch and a 12 volt DC power supply if you just simply want to manually control the uh, the water shutoff to the home. So, uh, once again, the water shutoff valve would be a great addition to any installation. Also, we have the Elk 9200. This is for automating of the electric hot water heater. Uh, I'm sorry, 9200, I think I said 91, I meant 9200. This is our heavy duty contactor. The Elk 9200 can handle a load of 220 volt AC up to 30 amps. So it's great for those electric hot water heaters, pumps, motors, or any high current load that uh, is 220 volt up to 30 amps. Typically you would use the 9200 in conjunction with an appliance module, say from Insteon, UPB, or Z-Wave or it can be controlled with a switched outlet. It operates off of 120 volt AC in order to control that heavy duty load. So certainly it could be a great addition to, to any installation with an automation controller or in a standalone application as well. Our keypad programming, uh, like I said earlier, it is a English text keypad language. So everything is spelled out for you. Very simple to navigate either through the navigator or the regular LCD keypads. The programming software, Elk RP2 uh, programming software, certainly simplifies the installation. If you can check a box or use the drop down or enter a description, you pretty much mastered the software. And then you have the powerful rule engine in Elk RP, where you can create that customization and automation features for our homeowner. Now we're going to talk about the M1 main board itself, the panel layout, some operation and wiring installation tips. But before I do so, I'd like to let you know that the M1 is available in kit forms. We have several different kits to select from. Uh, looking at the top, the first two, this, uh, these two kits, the basic difference is the style keypad, the larger keypad versus the KP2 keypad. The kits include the 14 by 14 inch metal enclosure, the Elk SWB14 as well as the battery, transformer, speaker, RJ set, basically everything needed to set up a hardwired 16 zone system. We also have a kit available with our Elk 2A wireless transceiver, which lets you get the transceiver for free in the kit and also a 6010 key fob. We offer a kit with no keypad if you'd like to select from one of the other options. And for those larger installations, we offer the kit with no enclosure, so you can add a larger enclosure. 
for instance, the Elk SWB28. This is our 28 by 20, I'm sorry, 14 by 28 inch enclosure. We have uh, several peripherals available to mount the, the uh, circuit boards in the enclosures, either the 14 or the 28. We have the SWB, SWP3 plate. This is our three inch multi-purpose plate. Our SWG glides, our circuit glides. Uh, we have a, a multi-purpose, a bigger multi-purpose plate, and then the battery shelf. The 28-inch enclosure, the SWB28, can house the main board, the battery, and approximately 10 to 11 different expansion modules. What I've offered here is the M1 mounted in the SWB14. As you can see, there's a little room on the left and the right-hand side for a peripheral. In this case, we've mounted the M1XIN, our 16-zone input expander on the left using the circuit glides. We've taken the M1XEP and mounted it on the circuit glides as well here on the right, the battery at the bottom, and then we have one of our data bus hubs. Now, like, this is 14-inch enclosure. I would say a maximum of a 32 hardwired zone or a wireless system. But beyond that, you might want to consider using the Elk SWB28. As you can see, the main board mounts at the top. Still have that room on the left and the right-hand side to mount a peripheral. The battery shelf keeps the battery closer to the circuit board. Then using the SWP3 plate, you can mount your peripherals parallel to the back of the enclosure, or using the circuit glides, you can mount them going, the circuit, um, circuit boards going across. So depending on how you want your, in, your installation to look, you have several different options there to choose from on how to mount circuit boards in our enclosures. Now the main board itself, you'll notice it has the green terminal blocks on the left and the right hand side. These are Phoenix connectors and they are removable. In a worst case scenario, if for some reason you did have to take an M1 board out, the only physical thing you would need to disconnect would be the battery lead. Everything else, uh, just simply pop the terminal off, put the new board in, put the terminals back on and reprogram in probably under five minutes. Upper left hand side of the board, we have our 16 onboard zones. Below that, we have our AC input and auxiliary DC voltage output, the master on off switch, the battery leads. On the bottom of the black plastic housing, we have the uh, white barcode sticker that has the serial number. Now, this is a unique number to each M1. No two serial numbers have ever been duplicated. And it'll start with the number zero. You'll need that information when you use the RP software to start programming. The serial number can also be found through keypad programming as well. The upper right hand side is a standard POTS line telco connection. Next below or right below that we have our RS-232 serial port. Below that, J16, which is this white header pin here, this is outputs 7 through 16. Then we have outputs 1, 2, and 3. And then find the data bus connection for our M1 system. The hardwired, main, uh, the hardwired zones on the main board, each zone can be configured with the end-of-line supervised, supervisory resistor, which is a 2.2K ohm resistor or they can be configured normally open or normally closed with no resistor required. Now, this is per zone. This is not a global setting. The purpose of the inline resistor is for proper supervision of the wiring going to the sensor. So the resistor should be at the furthest end at the end of the loop. If it's not possible to get the resistor at the sensor itself, you can simply omit it and not not install the resistor. Therefore, you're not trying to incorporate that resistor in a B connector in the can, making for a messier installation. You can simply leave it out and configure the zone normally open or normally closed. Now, some devices require the resistor. For instance, four wire smokes would require the resistor and it would have to be at the sensor. Any zone on an M1 system, including those on our hardwired input expander, can accept a four-wire smoke detector. However, 
only zone 16 will support a two-wire smoke detector. Zone 16, the special jumper JP1 to select from a normal zone to two-wire. You can have a maximum of 20 detectors daisy-chained together. Those detectors must be listed on page six of the installation manual to ensure they're compatible with an M1 system. For two-wire smokes, it requires a different end-of-line resistor. It's an 820 ohm. And those, uh, like I said, zone 16, your only zone for two-wire smokes with the M1 must be listed on page six. You can have a maximum of 20 of those detectors daisy-chained together. We also offer temperature sensing capability. We have our M1 ZTS. This is our zone temperature sensor with the probe built inside, a white, uh, nice small white ABS housing with the temperature probe inside. We also have that in the M1 ZTSR. Now this has the seven foot probe with a stainless steel probe on the end of it here. These units can measure from minus 50 up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. This is great for monitoring the temperature in, say, a server room or a commercial freezer or a wine cellar, an animal habitat, or simply anywhere where we would want to monitor that temperature, have it displayed on our keypad or on an app or something along those lines. And we can use that in the rule engine to create scenarios where if the temperature gets too hot or too cold, we can control fans uh, or, or send emails, call somebody, and so forth. Now, these devices do connect to the main board only, so you can have a maximum of 16 of these sensors connected to an M1 system. Now, the, uh, the ZTSR with the stainless steel probe, this probe is weatherproof but not waterproof, so it should not be submerged into a liquid. But it's certainly uh, certainly capable of going into those harsher environments like, it, say, a freezer or a cooler. The hardwired expansion capabilities of an M1 system is done through the M1XIN. This is our 16-zone hardwired expander. This is part of our data bus. So you can have a maximum of 12 expanders on the data bus. The dip switch determine the blue dip switches here in the picture determine the starting address. Now, being that the uh, they're part of the data bus, they do not have to be located at the main control. They can be remotely located if you would like, if it makes more sense to home run the sensors back to a central location. In this case, you could use, say, our ELK SWB14 and either the SWP3 plate or the circuit glides to mount this board or several boards into those enclosures if it makes more sense to have them remotely located. We also have several different wireless options. The, the M1 system, a total of 208 zones, and of that 208, 144 of those can be wireless. Elk Products, we're very proud to, to introduce the Elk Two-Way Wireless Advantage. This is an enhanced security uh, encrypted type transmission. It's a frequency hopping uh, scenario. Our sensors work off of a 902 to 928 megahertz. Because they're constantly changing, it's harder to jam and detect that signal. So it's a, it's a very robust signal. Every signal from each sensor is acknowledged by the transceiver. We have an on-demand status indicator for our FOBs, which helps to avoid those unsafe conditions. Our indoor motion sensor has a nice, bright, white courtesy convenience LED built into it. We've tried to simplify the installation by giving our installers a bicolor LED to confirm that the signal has been received. We also have a walk test feature, and then our smoke detectors have a sound all feature. I'm gonna go over a little bit of those here in just a second. What I'd like to show you is what we currently offer in our product line for our two-way wireless. Uh, the first here is our Elk M1X RFTWM. This is our transceiver. 
you can have a maximum of four of the transceivers connected to the M1's data bus. Their uh, supported addresses are two through five, so the first one would have to start at address two, and then you can add up to three additional transceivers to the data bus. Now, that would help increase the coverage area or help to eliminate any dead zones or weak signal strength areas. We have an outdoor motion sensor, our ELK 6032. We have our single button panic, the 6011. Our 6040 glass break sensor, the 6050 sound all smoke detector. And the reason we call it a sound all is it has an 85 decimal sounder built into it. When smoke is detected, the sensor goes into alarm. It sends a signal to the M1. The M1 then turns around and sends a signal to the other 6050s that are learned in, so they all start sounding. That's part of the sound all feature for the uh, L2 way wireless. Likewise, if the if the M1 system goes into alarm, say a, a four wire smoke gets tripped, it'll still send that signal to the other 6050s so they start sounding. If a function key on the keypad is pressed and is programmed for fire, it'll then send the signal to all the 6050s. So part of our sound all feature is that when the system goes into fire alarm, all of the 6050s will start sounding. We offer a 6023, our recess window door sensor, our 6010 four button fob, 6020, 6021 and the 6022 window door sensor. Now the 6022 is a universal three zone sensor so that you have the built-in read plus the addition of two hardwired contacts available. Our 6030 motion which is available in the 6030P for the pet immune. Talk about a couple key features for our two-way wireless. Uh, our 6010 fob uh, has the standard four button fob. We also give you what we call button three or the inquiry button. Now when a homeowner presses the inquiry button, if the green LED at the top lights, I'm sorry, if the LED at the top lights up green, means the system is disarmed. If it lights up red, the system is armed. If it's flashing red, system has been in alarm at some point. So from a homeowner standpoint, if, if uh, they f can't remember if they armed the system as they're walking out the door, press the inquiry button, solid red, yep, system's armed. Homeowner comes home in the evening, may have that uneasy feeling, press the inquiry button, flash is red, they know their home's been in alarm at some point and they should uh, not enter the premise. Our 6011, our, our single button panic, has the confirmation LED that when the button is pressed, it lights up red, indicates it got through, the signal was received. So there's no wondering whether or not the, the signal was received. You now have that visual confirmation, the signal got through. With our 6020 and our 6021 and 22 sensor, there is the bicolor transmission status LED built into the center see it right here in the picture. When I move the magnet away from the sensor, if that LED lights up green, it got through. The signal was received and acknowledged. If it lights up red, signal was not received. Either it's not enrolled or you're out of range. Now from a um, uh, from an installation standpoint, if you're not certain whether or not one of the elk transceivers will cover the, the area, you can mock up an M1 system with the transceiver as you're walking around into the areas where the sensor is going to be uh, mounted. You move the magnet away from the sensor, it lights up green, you know your signal was received. Move down a few windows or doors, turns green, received, go down a little further, turns red, you're out of range. Another feature that we've built into the M1 system is called the walk test mode. If you have a speaker connected to output one and you put the panel in walk test mode, as you trip that sensor, it's going to speak a level from one to eight. That's the total number of data packets. Uh, if you hear level eight, that's the maximum number of data packets. That's a good strong signal. 
as you're moving around, you hear eight, seven, six, everything's good. You start hearing less than five, you know you're receiving less than half the data signals, data packets. At that point, you might want to consider relocating the transceiver, or you may consider needing to add additional transceivers to help increase the coverage area. Maximum of four transceivers on the M1's data bus. So the, the bicolor status LED, the walk test mode, couple features that ELK has built into our system for the installers to help ensure you get good, strong wireless signals. Now this 6021 is exceptionally thin. It's a very small uh, transmitter. It's for wood and vinyl windows only, non-metallic surfaces. The 6023 is our recessed version. Our 6022 with the built-in read and magnet plus the option to have two external contacts hardwired to this unit so you do have a true universal three zone sensor our 6030 our our motion detector has the bicolor transmission status led as well as this bright white courtesy convenience led that can be controlled through the rules so that we can give a uh, a momentary activation or we can have it flash or just simply turn on during certain events like for instance uh, the way the LED is controlled we're doing it through outputs built into the M1 so when we turn on output 4 for instance every time motion is detected it's going to turn on for approximately 17 seconds if output 5 is on then it's going to cause it to flash. So, for instance, uh, in the second rule there, uh, whenever the telephone line is ringing, then turn output 5 on. That's going to cause that LED to flash for about 30 seconds. So, if somebody is uh, maybe hearing impaired, uh, they may not hear the phone ringing. We now have a way to alert them that the, the telephone is ringing by causing that LED and that motion detector to start flashing. Likewise, we have our ELK 930, that is a telephone ring detector, a doorbell ring detector as well. We could integrate that with the standard doorbell system to get, to alert the customers that the doorbell is ringing, cause that, that LED to start flashing. A new product that uh, we've recently released is the ELK 6051. This is our CO sensor. Very nice, compact, very very low profile CO sensor. Has a 10 year life expectancy, operates off standard AAA batteries. A nice feature about this unit is the diagnostic smartphone app that you can download for field testing. The app allows you to test uh, how many times it's been off the base, the expected battery life, the number of alarms and so forth. Just a simple, very nice app for field testing of our 6051 CO sensor. We also have other options for wireless. Uh, like I said, we, have, we can do up to a total of 144 wireless zones. Now we have our ELK M1X RF EG. This is our receiver that supports the Interlogic or GE 319.5 megahertz signal. We also have the M1X RF2H. This supports the Honeywell 5800 series of uh, wireless transmitters. So if it's an existing system that you might be taking out and it has the GE, you can have the XRF EG receiver and possibly reuse those wireless sensors or Honeywell sensors. Now we're also very uh, pleased to announce that we have a new line of 319.5 sensors. It's called the ELK 319 series. Now these are one way, they're not the two way like our other product line, but they're very dependable, economical and versatile sensors built the ELK way with superior performance for long life. These are compatible with the M1 system using our XRF EG receiver, or they can be used with any wireless receiver that supports the GE Interlogic 319.5 um, format. Currently, we have the following sensors available in our product line. We have an all-weather door gate, uh, window shock, 
rate of rise, uh, heat rate of rise, one button panic, a mini window door, a recess version, four button fob. Doesn't that four button fob look nice? And then a, a heavy duty unit there. So several different options available for Elk wireless. Uh, we can do the Elk two-way wireless, GE wireless, and Honeywell wireless with an M1 system. It is even possible to mix and match the technologies. You just need to make sure that you have the appropriate transceiver or receiver and that the sensors are within range of their supported transceiver and receiver. But a total of 144 wireless zones that you can incorporate into an M1 system with several different options to select from. Now the power connections, that's the lower left-hand corner we're looking at now, the M1 main board. We have the SOX terminal. This is your switched output for your four-wire smokes or any other device that requires a power interruption. You'd want to use the SOX. We have the VOX terminal for your non-switch devices like your motions and glass brakes. The AC terminal for our transformer, the Elk 6, uh, TRG1640. The master on-off switch does both the AC and the battery. So from a troubleshooting or maintenance or installation, if you simply need to turn the system off, you turn off both the AC and the battery with the one switch, nothing to disconnect. The battery connections on the board, that will support up to approximately an 18 amp hour sealed lead acid battery. Now the M1 system is a 12 volt DC system. The board itself in a non-alarm condition has one amp continuous output. And that's a combination of the SOX, the VOX, the data bus, and J16, the low voltage outputs on the board. So at any given time, you can have one amp continuous output. In the event the system goes into alarm, it'll output two and a half amps with the additional current coming from the battery. But for those larger installations, or if you simply need additional power, we offer the Elk P212S. This is our remote power supply. It can be supervised over the M1's data bus, or it can be a standalone power supply. When, you, when it's uh, connected to the M1's data bus, supervised, it will give you an indication for uh, AC failure and low battery. It's great for those larger installations. It gives you two amps of current. It has a programmable output, which can be used with the rule engine, the RP rules, so that you can control the output, maybe for an electric strike or a mag lock. And it does require its own battery and transformer, not included. In a standalone application, if you just simply need a very good two amp power supply, the unit has the master on off switch, it has low battery cutoff, so in the event AC is out and we're running off battery, when the battery reaches approximately 10.2 volts, it'll shut the system down. It has the relay outputs for AC fail and low battery at that point. So very, good in, uh, very good product if you need additional power either for an M1 system or just simply as a, a very good two amp power supply. The upper right-hand side of the board is the telco connection for the standard POTS line connection. Now, the M1 system, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can pick up a house phone. You can dial star, star, star to access the voice prompts. House phone can be used as a keypad. You can call into the system to access the voice prompts. Uh, there's several. You can do it uh, fully automatic, which after a number of rings, it'll pick up, or if there's an answering machine or an answering service, we have the ring, hang up, and answer feature to get around those. For proper line seizure, the M1 should be the very first device that the incoming phone line connects to. The M1 knows when the phone is ringing based upon the rule we saw earlier. So the M1 is always on the phone. It's always monitoring the phone line. It, it knows when it goes off hook. It knows when it's ringing. It knows when you're trying to call into it to access the voice prompts. Being that it's uh, constantly on, and it's the very first device that, uh, that the incoming phone line is connected to, it could be the very first device that any incoming surge could affect the M1. So in the kits, we give you the Elk 952 surge suppressor. 
We tried to make the 952s as easy as possible to incorporate into the installation. We tried to make it plug and play. So you simply unplug one end of the RJ31X, plug it 952 into it, and then the modular cable back to the M1. The only physical connection you need to make is the earth ground. Now we would really highly recommend to be connected to a driven ground rod, but then a cold metallic water pipe would be okay. Lastly, the electrical AC ground of the building. Uh, in order for the 952 to work to its most effectiveness, it needs to be grounded. Communication and reporting. Our M1 system follows the industry standards, contact ID, SIA, 4 plus 2, and so forth. Two-way listen-in, we have an option for, for alarm verification or for customer convenience. Uh, we have the integrated voice dialer and so forth. And we have our onboard RS-232 port, which does several different things. We're going to talk about them in a second. But first, I'd like to tell you about the two-way listen-in option for an M1 Gold. Now, primarily, this is for central station verification of alarms to avoid those unnecessary dispatches. But certainly, a homeowner could use this feature if they wanted to call in over the phone line, maybe check on an elderly or a loved one or a caregiver, so forth. You can have up to 12 microphones connected to an M1 system on three separate zones. Now, we have two different interfaces available. The Elk M1 TWI, just a standard interface that allows you to connect to 12 microphones. We also have the M1 TWA. Now, the TWA is a little bit more versatile, and it doesn't even need to be used with the two-way listen-in. The, the TWA, the amplified version, um, output one on the main board is where the interior voice and siren sounds are generated. Now you can adjust that volume for those speakers based upon a non-alarm condition versus an alarm condition. You can have different levels of volume, but it's fixed to all of the speakers that are connected to output one. With the TWA interface, there are three amplifiers on this board. You can have multiple speakers connected to each output with their own volume control. So you can have a maximum four ohm load on each output with each set of speakers, its own volume control. Take for instance, if it's a multi-level home where the upstairs area is the sleeping area. Now you maybe you have a, a baby's room near a speaker, or perhaps somebody who works more during the evenings or nights and they sleep more during the day, you they may not they may not want to hear the voice messages that the M1 is generating. Or you may want to make them lower in volume. You can do that with the TWA interface. And also you have the capability of being able to mute those zones. So at maybe 8 a.m. in the morning, we mute those zones until or those speakers rather, until 4 p.m. in the afternoon. That way those, those individuals are not being bothered by the voice messages. Great, great product, the M1 TWA, very versatile, individual volume control for different speakers, as well as being able to mute those speakers at certain times. As far as a speaker microphone combination, we have two available. We have a surface mount, the M1 TWS, and then a flush mount, the M1 TWSF, and then just the microphone by itself. Just to reiterate a little bit, the alternative to telephone reporting, we, all, we have our C1M1, our dual path communicator for reporting IP and cellular. We also have the XEP module, which does IP reporting. And also on the market, there are a number of uh, universal GSM units that are compatible with this with the M1 system. The main serial port, which is located <clears throat> right here on the main board, this serves several purposes. First, you can do a direct connect to from your computer to the M1 for programming. That requires a USB to RS-232 cable. We do offer one called the Elk USB to 232. And that allows you to program the system directly. Serial port zero is where the C1M1 would connect. 
C1M1 mounts inside the 14 and the 28 inch enclosure as shown in the picture. And then the, or the XEP module would connect to serial port zero and then to the local area network. Now with the C1M1 and the XEP, you have, you can communicate over the local area network to the system, or you can connect through the internet in order to make programming changes. Now there is a, there's, there's one integration partner that does require the serial port, it's Elon, uh, but we do have possibly a solution, our IP232 module, which is a serial to ethernet bridge, possibly could be used to convert the serial port of the Elon system into IP to go onto the local area network. Onboard outputs, we have output one, which is located right here on the green terminal block. This is for your interior speakers. Now you can have a, a series parallel combination of speakers as long as you keep the overall load above four ohms. So multiple speakers, series parallel, keeping above four ohms. Output one for interior voice and siren. Output two is a supervised output, typically used for exterior devices. Now uh, it is set up to, when it's set up for siren output, you can have multiple speakers connected, keeping that four ohm load, or you can select it to be a voltage output, in which case it's 12 volt at one amp. So uh, make sure if you're using a self-contained driver, self-contained siren, or any other voltage device that it doesn't draw more than the one amp. If you're not using output two, install a 2.2 K ohm resistor, as shown in the, speak, in the picture here, to prevent the output two trouble condition. Uh, without the resistor, you'll get an output two trouble on the keypad, so we wanna make sure that output two sees a load. Output three, Right above output two there is a general purpose form C relay. It's a dry contact. It's programmed using the rule engine. Great for maybe creating those uh, dry contacts across a garage door opener. If we wanna automate the garage door opener and so forth. Outputs seven through 16, which is the J16 connector here. These are low voltage outputs. They're 12 volt at 50 milliamps each and they're positive switched. That too is uh, programmed using the rule engine. Now, if you actually need more relays, we have the M1RB. This is our relay board that connects to J16, in which case it'll convert outputs uh, nine through 16 into physical relays. Now these relays are, are a little beefier. They're rated at tw uh, up to 120 volt AC at approximately eight amps. You still have two low voltage outputs, but then you'd have eight physical relays at that point. Beyond the onboard outputs, we have the M1X OVR. This is our output expansion board. It's part of the data bus. The dip switches here set the address, which will determine the starting relay output. There's eight relays and eight low voltage outputs on the XOVR. However, you can convert the low voltage outputs into physical relays by using the M1RB. Uh, the wiring harness, you can connect both these boards together. And now you actually have 16 physical relays off of the M1 system. You have a total of 205 outputs off of an M1 system. Now, with the XOVR being a data bus device, it can be located at the panel, or it too can be remotely located if it makes more sense to say, have it in the mechanical room if we're doing sprinkler control or something along those lines. Some access control features of the system. Uh, we can support up to 199 users, and that can be codes, cards, or fobs. Eight areas, 16 doors. We support 26-bit Wigan output devices. We have a 512 event history log, and you can set up schedules using the RP2 software. When interfacing the reader to an M1 system, the 26-bit Wigan readers do not connect directly to the M1 or to the data bus. They connect to the back 
of one of our compatible keypads or to our access control module. This is the access control module here on the far right. We call it the M1KAM. There's one reader per keypad or access control module. These are the supported keypads that you can have a reader connected to. For the M1KP or the KPB, we offer an optional internal prox reader, which will connect to J2. It's called the M1PR, and it's used in conjunction with our cards and fobs. The read range is about half inch, so you have to kind of get kind of close to the keypad in order to read the cards or the fobs, but that gives you an internal option for a prox reader. For an external reader, we have the W035A wiring harness, which connects the J2. Then you can have your external reader approximately 20 feet from the keypad. For the KP2 and the KP3, it's an external reader only. The, it would connect to J2 using the W039A wiring harness. And once again, you'd connect, uh, you have about 20 feet from the keypad that you can have your 26-bit Wigan reader. The CAM module, the keypad, um, the reader connects directly to the CAM. There's an onboard relay that can be controlled through the rules so that you can, you can control the voltage over to a door strike or a magnetic lock. We also have a request to exit input on the CAM and a door prop hold, uh, door prop option. Now, the CAM is basically takes the keypad location when connected to the data bus. You can have a maximum of 16 keypads. The CAM module is considered a keypad when connected to the data bus. We do offer a prox reader. It's called the ELK 106055. Uh, 26-bit Wigan, it's used in conjunction with our PRC cards or our PRF fobs. However, you can use basically anyone's 26-bit Wigan reader, say an HID, an AWID, Roslair, Essex, and so forth. I would just encourage you to make sure that you've got the cards and the fobs from the same manufacturer as the reader to ensure their compatibility. The last connection on the M1 main board is the M1 data bus. Now, the data bus connection, uh, it, our data bus is a true RS-485 data bus. It might be a little different from, from other security systems you've used in the past, but the 485 data bus, which communicates at 38,400 baud rate, uh, it'll support to no more than two home runs. Now, the devices that you can connect to our data bus are include our keypads, our hardwired expansion modules, our wireless receivers, the output expanders, and the serial port expanders, as well as the supervised power supply and the access control module. Those are all considered bus type devices. Now, for the, for the each, device has its own bus type. For instance, keypads are considered bus type 1. Input expanders and wireless receivers are bus type 2. Output expanders are bus type 3 and so forth. It is fully possible that you can have a keypad at address 2, an input expander at address 2, and an output expander at address 2 with no conflicts. That's perfectly acceptable. So you can you have a lot of um, a lot of different bus devices that can communicate over our 485 data bus. The 485 data bus has no more than two home runs connected, so that you can daisy chain devices together. It also requires proper termination of the bus. Now the termination means uh, installing or engaging a 120 ohm resistor across the data A and data B of the bus. It's looking for two of those, one at the beginning, one at the end of the data bus. And the purpose for the terminating jumpers, the resistors, is for balance, for, uh, to properly balance the bus to help prevent any corrupt data or erroneous data or anything like that that possibly could 
cause interruption in communication from the device to the M1. So, and the M1 main board, if you look in the picture I have here, JP3 on the M1 main board has the 120 ohm resistor built in. And when you install that black jumper across JP3, that engages that resistor across data A and data B at the panel. Every, uh, most of our data bus devices have the same resistor built into them and you use the black jumper to engage it. So in a case of daisy chaining devices, for instance, for instance, in, in the picture I have at the bottom, little block diagram there, I have two home runs coming off of the M1 using four conductor. The top one, I've daisy chained a keypad and then an input expander. The second home run, I've daisy chained an output expander and another keypad. The last two devices on, the, on each home run would have the terminating jumper installed, which would engage that 120 ohm resistor and basically put them in parallel with each other. If I were to power down the system and measure the resistance across data A and data B here at the control, I would read between 60 and 70 ohms approximately. Now that lets me know that I'm seeing two terminating jumpers and, and hopefully they're on the last device of each home run. In a case of two home runs, the M1 is in the middle, so I would not have the jumper on JP3. That jumper would be left off. It doesn't necessarily mean the data bus is wired correctly, because I could have easily reversed A and B at a device and still got this a good resistance reading. But it's kind of a troubleshooting tip tech support may ask you to do in the event if you, if you should happen to have a, an issue with a data bus connection or device, we may ask you to power down, measure the resistance across A and B. If you're reading 120 ohms, we know we're missing a jumper or we have a broken wire somewhere. If you read less than 40, we know we have too many jumpers, which can be a problem as well. So some device got jumpered accidentally and it needs, uh, that one jumper needs to be taken out. Now that's daisy chaining, like I said, you can have two home runs, daisy chain devices together, in which case the maximum distance would be 4,000 total feet for the entire data bus. Some installers have no problem with daisy chaining, some would prefer to home run back to a central location. And for that, we've, uh, we have a solution, we have our Elk M1 DBH. This is our M1 data bus hub for new installations. With the M1 DBH, it uses a CAT5 or a CAT6 wire from the hub all the way out to the device itself. That could be a keypad, an input expander, an output expander, wireless receiver, all the way from the hub to the device. The purpose of the CAT5 is that we're using six of the eight conductors inside the jacket. We're using two of those as a return path, one for data A, one for data B. The hub, the DBH, does the daisy chaining for you. So at the hub, it's going to create that daisy chain effect. Therefore, you don't have to do any other uh, connections other than put the install the RJ45 connector and plug it into the hub. Now you'll notice there's nine, oh the hub itself has uh, an RJ45 connector that included with the hub that as you add devices, it has the resistor built in it, as you add devices you simply move that terminating plug to the next available port. In this case I have two devices connected, one to J1, one to J2. I have my terminating plug in J3. If I add another device to the installation, I would move the terminating plug to J4 and plug my device into J3 and just simply add, keep adding devices. There are nine ports on this hub. Please don't think you're limited to nine devices. You're not. You can have 
two of these hubs in parallel with each other, which would be your two home runs, essentially, or you can daisy chain the hubs together. The installation manual will explain how to daisy chain the hubs together so that you can have more ports available on the data bus. Now, because we're using the two conductors as the return path for the data, each home run must be calculated as doubled when configuring the overall data bus link. So with the DBH hub, you now have a total of a 2,000 foot data bus. For those that are using four conductor, or if it's a scenario where it's a takeover with existing multiple four conductor home runs, we have the M1DBHR. This is the M1 data bus retrofit hub. The retrofit hub uh, will support multiple four wire home runs. E there are four branches on the retrofit hub. Each one of these branches is basically its own 485 data bus, similar to the M1 itself. So with the four branches, there's a tremendous amount of information being uh, sent between the branches back to the M1. So it's important to make sure that the DBHR is as close to the M1 as possible within the same enclosure. The physical connection from the DBHR, the blue terminal block here at the top, to the M1 needs to be as short as possible. You can have a maximum of two DBHRs in parallel with each other. Each one of them has its own terminating resistor, similar to what the main control has. Each branch has its own terminating resistor, similar to the M1. In the case of uh, branch one, for instance, that terminating resistor is located on JP2. Branch three is JP4. Branch four is JP5 uh, and so forth. Each branch will support two home runs in which you can daisy chain devices or have single devices connected. You just have to make sure for proper termination. As far as wiring for the M1 DBH and the RJ45, from the RJ45 connector all the way to the device itself, in this case I have a keypad with a wiring harness. With the wiring harness for the data A, we'll actually have three connections, data A to the device and then the return path for data A. Data B will have three connections. That's the data B to the device, then the return path back to the hub. For a device with screw terminals, you have two wires under data A and two wires under data B for that particular device. Now, like I said, no more than two terminating jumpers. If we are you may be instructed by tech support to power down and measure the resistance of the data bus. We're looking to see between 60 and 70 ohms across A and B at the panel. So the three methods to wire for the data bus, you can daisy chain, you can use the M1 DBH and a CAT5 or CAT6, or you can use existing four conductor in the M1 DBHR, our data bus retrofit. Now, right now, I'd like to uh, just to give you a quick example on, on how the data bus and the jumpers would look. So in this little test here, if we have the M1 and then we have a single home run coming off of the M1 in which we've daisy chained two keypads together, if you take a moment and, and think about where you would install the jumpers. And in this case, the jumpers would be at A, or the main control, JP3, and at the last device on the home run. It's a, it's a daisy chain configuration, so the last device would be jumpered and the control itself. If we were to power down, measure across A and B, we should get the 60 to 70 ohms. In a case of two home runs, off of the main control. We're daisy chaining devices together. We still have our two keypads, and now we have three input expanders we've daisy chained together. In this scenario, 
the last device on each home run would be terminated. In the case of the M1DBH, our data bus hub, as I'm adding devices to the hub, in this case I have five devices, I've ran my CAT5 all the way from the hub to the device, made my connections, where would you install the terminating jumper and or the terminating plug in this case. So the main board would be terminated, that would be JP3, and then the first unused port of the hub would have that RJ45 with the resistor built into it. If I kept adding devices, say for instance I added two more devices, I would then move my terminating uh, plug to J8, plug my new devices into J6 and J7. Now the retrofit hub may look a little bit more complicated, but if we simply think of each branch independently, it's basically the same as if we're doing the control. So in this case we have one retrofit hub, we have the main control, and then we have several different devices on each branch in several configurations. So in this scenario, we've terminated the main control, JP3, and the retrofit hub board would be terminated. Branch 1 is its own 485 data bus. It's a single home run with two devices daisy chained. The last device on the home run would be terminated as well as the branch itself. That's JP2. JP2 follows branch 1. Branch two, two home runs, the last device on each home run would be terminated, but not the branch. The branch is basically in the middle. Branch three, two home runs, last device on each home run would be terminated, but not the branch itself. Lastly, branch four, one single device connected to branch four, the device is terminated as well as the branch. And, and once again, if we, if we power down, measure across A and B on each branch and at the main control, we should read between 60 and 70 ohms of resistance. All right. Now this this concludes the uh, this portion of the of the webinar, going over the basics and the wiring tips. Uh, give me just one second, I'd like to, to change gears and introduce the software, take just a couple minutes to introduce the Elk RP2 programming software and give you some uh, instructions on, on how that operates. Bear with me just one second. Okay, when you go to our website at elkproducts.com, you click support. Under the support tab, you can register for your username and password to the site. Once you have your username and password to the site, uh, you can download the software, Elk RP2, as well as any manuals and documentation that are available uh, at no additional charge. You can download the software. You can also uh, get a link to, to previously recorded webinars that we've done over the years, as well as the form if you'd like to post questions on the form. Once you have your software downloaded, uh, the first thing I like for installers to do is once, once you're ready to start programming, you, you open your software and there's some, uh, there's some default accounts already in there if you'd like to view those. But what I like to start with is we go File, we go New Account. And when you do File New Account, RP is going to ask you a couple of questions. First, the account ID. And that's simply what you want to call this account versus any other M1 account that you may have. It can be the customer's name. It can be a central station number. It's entirely up to you. So we're just going to do training today. Now, for the system type, we have, when you use the drop down, you get three options. Today, we talked about the M1 Gold. There's also a little brother to the M1 Gold called the M1 EZ8. Uh, the EZ8 is only eight zones on the main board, expandable up to 200. It does not have the voice capability like the M1 does. 
and the serial port is it's an optional serial port through an add-on module so uh, with the m1 gold you get definitely more feature rich system but as far as a, a programmable logic controller the ez8 inputs outputs and logic through the rule engine it ter it certainly has uh, its its place as well. I've used it in several applications where we've done, say, a break bell type scenario where we're just simply controlling outputs. But uh, the two systems that we offer is the M1 Gold and the M1 EZ8. The middle option you saw there was the M1 Standard, which was a product that we released uh, at the beginning. We were going to have three platforms. Of, of control panels and then about a year later we decided to simplify and have the two platforms so uh, there may be some standard panels still out there so we leave that option available in the RP software but for the most part you will be selecting M1G the serial number is located on the bottom of the black plastic housing it's an eight digit number starts with zero uh, make us up a serial number the RP access code is basically what allows my computer to connect to the system. If you change the RP access code, that would prevent anyone else's computer from connecting. But important information, the information about what happens if, if you should change the RP access code and something happens, you forget it, you have a computer crash or something along those lines, the panel has to be factory defaulted in order to, to get back into it. Now, speaking of uh, your accounts, the accounts that you create are stored, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, the accounts are stored under C Drive Program Data RP Elk Accounts 2.mdb. The Elk Accounts 2.mdb is your all of your accounts that you've created. I would highly recommend that at some point periodically you make a backup of that and store that off-site or to a to a secure location just in case you should ever have that catastrophic computer failure you have a means to get your accounts back uh, if, if something happens also a feature of the M1 system or the Elk RP software rather is what's called synchronization of a database you can have a master database which may be on your your company server and then the that would be the master database and then the individual technicians computers would be the uh, remote database and they can sync with each other so that's a feature in RP that allows uh, for for syncing of databases to a central location now today I'm going to create a default account which is basically a generic account so I'm going to click OK and what RP is doing for me now is just creating that generic information the first screen that opens when you open an, and create an account is the account detail screen this is basically a clerical screen that allows you to do to enter the customer's name address maybe spe put special notes or so forth depending on the locations the system column here on the right will automatically fill in once you've connected to the system if you're using the XEP module you have the XEP setup here and you can tell RP to go out onto the local local area network and find your XEP and return its IP address if you have the C1M1 it too has a find method that allows it to go out on the local area network and find your C1M1 and report back the IP address so this would allow you to connect over the local area network and we still have the means to do a direct connect so once uh, once you are able to connect to the system RP will do what we call conflict checking what conflict checking does for you it compares what's in your database or what's on your computer versus what's actually programmed in the M1 and it'll bring back the differences or the conflicts that will let you know that you either need to resolve the conflict by sending information from the database or your computer to the system or receiving from the panel into the database that way you can you can get the correct information to the panel or to your database 
Under account detail, we have users. The system is always expecting to see one user. When you double click on user one, here I can change the name. I can assign a new code if I like, or I can have RP generate a code for me. I can select the areas that my code is valid in and so forth. When you're ready to create new users, right click on the word user, create new user. RP is going to ask you two questions. One, do you want how many users do you want to create and starting at which available user location? In this case, I'm going to do three. Starting at number two, it's going to ask me one more question. Do I want to copy from another user or use custom or default values? I'm going to say custom values. And now RP has created me three more additional users. So this may be uh, John. In this case, uh, this is John's code. He's only uh, allowed access in the area one, and he can arm and disarm the system. User three, I'm going to set up a quick prox code. We're going to use a prox card, for instance. Notice we have the user has access credential. If you click help, if you're using the ELK cards and FOBs, we actually print the site code or facility code and the card PIN number on our cards and FOBs. That's very helpful and useful if you're doing this and you want to set everything up ahead of time. You can manually enter that information into RP if we're doing something related to, say, access control. Now, if it's a manufacturer that doesn't print the information on the cards and fobs, I would recommend you have the reader connected to the back of one of our keypads. That way, you can, you can go ahead and configure the user here and send that to the panel, and then from the reader connected to the keypad, we can manually learn in those cards and fobs and then receive that information back into, into ELK RP. Now the last one I want to create is the uh, cleaning crew, because I'm going to write a rule here shortly that uh, uh, where we'll enable and disable this particular user at certain times of the day. And you can set up 199 individual users. Next is areas. When you click areas, you'll see area one. By default, the system's always expected to see area one. When you click on area one, we can change the name. Now, this may be the main house. In our programming for our zone definitions, we give you the option for an entry exit one zone definition and an entry exit two zone definition. So if you have, a say, an overhead garage door, you may need more time in order to uh, pull, pull in, in order, to get to a, in order to get to a keypad before disarming, so we could set that timer value to a, to a longer value. Some of the arming options available, auto stay mode after exit time with no violation. I like this feature, especially if uh, somebody's not accustomed to a security system, maybe it's an elderly person. When you enable this feature, and if somebody should accidentally press exit, but they do not go through an entry exit zone, the system will automatically arm to the stay mode. So it's going to prevent that accidental uh, setting off of the motion detectors and so forth. It's going to eliminate that uh, false alarm condition. The restart exit timer feature, if, the, if you're leaving for the day, you press exit, you close the door, but realize you forgot your keys, you, you can open that zone one time while the exit delay is running, pick up the keys, close the door without having to disarm. That'll reset that, that timer one time uh, during that time period. We have single and double key press quick arm. It's an either or type scenario. When single is checked, I can press exit or stay without having to enter my code. When double is uh, selected, it requires two presses of that key in order to get the event to take place. With neither one of them checked, you always have to uh, enter your code to arm the system. 
right click on areas to create a new area. RP is going to ask you those uh, couple questions again. And this time, this might be the guest house. It too has those same options available as far as the entry exit and the arming options. Uh, the case, stay key scrolling option, uh, like I said, we have the six different arming levels. And depending on the zone definition, uh, will depend on how that zone is going to respond based upon the arm level. The stay key change if arms simply allows you, say for instance, if I'm if I come home, I arm my system to the stay mode. Later on, I realize everyone's in for the evening. I can press stay again. It'll go to the stay instant mode. When everyone is in for the evening, ready for, for bed, I can press stay again and go to the night mode. So that allows you to do that without having to disarm the system. If this is unchecked, I would have to disarm every time I wanted to change the arm status. Keypads, the system's always expecting to see one keypad, address one, even if you're integrating with Control 4, Crestron, another automation software, I would always have one keypad physically connected to the M1 just in case something should happen to the local area network you would still need to have access in order to arm and disarm. So the system's always expecting to see one keypad and you can rename it. This might be the, the front door. It's signed to area one. Different options as far as the keypad beeping during entry exit, the show date and time, Show temperature is for the two bigger keypads, the KP and the KPB. You have different backlight levels that you can adjust it to, or you can have it go totally dark after 60 seconds and no activity. Uh, now, if this is in a uh, near the front door, that might be a very good option to keep anyone from, from looking in to see the status of the system. If this is unchecked, then the keypad is going to dim down to the backlight level after 60 seconds and no activity. Depending on the keypad, you either have four function keys or definable keys or six function keys. Now those are programmable per keypad. You can do the traditional fire, police, medical, or you can set these keypads up to be totally independent and do different things like turn on outputs, control lighting, arm disarm another area. That's totally up to you on how you want to configure the M1 system. The illumination event here is, is what would cause that LED to light up. In the case of F1, it's going to be a fire alarm. When pressed, F, the fire alarm will cause that LED to illuminate. If you need additional protection or additional security for the function key, you can have requires code. If it's a commercial application or if there's busy fingers of it around, you may not want them to accidentally set off the fire alarm. Simply check requires code and you have to enter your code before the event would take place. Single key press means you just have to press that key once. If unchecked, it's a double press or press and hold. And then the name of the event, uh, say for fire and so forth. Or if it's an automation event, it might be garage door. If you want to control the garage door, uh, we can write a rule that turns on the output, which then uh, simulates the button press across the garage door opener. That can be done through the keypad. Adding keypads, right click, new keypad. RP is going to ask you several questions. And now we have our second keypad, which is assigned to the guest house, and that was area two. So now we have uh, that keypad going into the guest house. Total maximum 16 keypads. Zone inputs. We click on zone inputs. We have the hardwired main board. That's out. That's zones one through 16. Double click on zone one to expand it open. We can change that to the front door. We can set the definition and the type. The type's the wiring type. That would be either in the line supervised or it could be normally closed. The voice description here. Every zone can have a six word phrase from the, from the 500 word vocabulary. If you simply start typing, you can see what words are available. 
in this case, front door, and I want to say is opened. So as long as uh, I have enable chime selected and at the keypad the chime is enabled, every time the front door opens, it's going to speak this message. You can also set up zones to be non-alarm zones, which are more for automation purposes. So that you could have, say, a door leading into uh, uh, an area where you just simply want it enunciated, or maybe it's a zone you just simply want it enunciated. It's, it's not an alarm zone, but you want to know if somebody opens the liquor cabinet, opens the, a medicine cabinet, or, or things of that nature. You can set up zones to be non-alarm and then associate a voice description with it. Let's create some new wireless zones. So if I right click on zone inputs and go to new wireless zones, I'm going to ask where I want to start them. I'm going to start them at group two for 17 through 32. They look very similar to the hardwired main board, except now we have the wireless setup button. When you click wireless setup, you now have the option to enter either the TXID number, and that's for the GE and the ELK sensors, and, our, and even our new 319 series, or for the Honeywell, the HID serial number. So from a programming standpoint, if you have the sensors, those, that information is generally printed on the sensor. You can, you can sit at your desk in your office, program the system, give it to the technicians, they can install it, and everything is already pre-programmed and ready to go upon power up. The last thing I like to talk about under zone inputs, if we right click zone inputs and we do a hardwired group, group 13, that's the last one in the list, that is the actual zones that are built into the keypad harness for each keypad. So depending on the address of the keypad, KP1, for instance, zone 193, all the way through to the last keypad, which is uh, zone 208. The wireless setup option simply gives you the option now to adjust the act activation events for the four button fobs. For instance, button one, button two, your arm, disarm. You may set up button seven as a panic. That would be perfectly acceptable to do. Cutoff timers. Each individual alarm activation has its own cutoff timer or the amount of time that the siren is going to sound. So for instance, Berg duration, 600 seconds, a fire duration of 65,535, pretty much indefinitely until somebody disarms. The two I like to point out would be medical duration, which if you set up a, a panic situation, a medical alarm type situation, you may not want the siren sounds to activate it. If somebody's having a heart attack or a medical condition, we don't want the siren sounds to, to aggravate that situation anymore. So you set the cutoff duration at one second, which isn't long enough for the amplifier to fully turn on. The keypads will still beep. You can still get it to transmit to central station. There'll just be no siren sounds. Another one to consider would be water duration. And uh, say we have those water sensors around the house and the kids accidentally run the tub over. We may not want the sirens going off, but we certainly want the keypad to start beeping to alert uh, those in the home that, uh, yeah, we have a leak somewhere. The global settings. For the most part, everything is, is self-supplanatory for the tabs. The one I do like to point out is the, is the last one, the G29 through 42 special. If we are communicating with an integration partner like Crestron, Control 4, or even the apps, always make sure that all six of the serial port zero transmit options are enabled and sent to the panel. Telephones. Right click and create new telephones. In this case, I'm going to do two telephones. And this will be for my central station, for instance. But for telephone two, I'm going to set that up to call my cell phone. So in this case, and I'll make the uh, a voice dial. So now I can write a rule to call and deliver a voice message to my system. 
You can have up to eight telephone numbers programmed into the M1. The communicator. Communicator is what allows the M1 to send signals to your central station. It's broken down into different groups. Uh, let's take a look at the zone RCs, for instance, or report codes, zone RC or zone report codes. We have four columns here. We have the alarm, the restoral, the bypass, and the trouble. If the value within that column is a zero one, it means it's enabled. It's ready to send that alarm condition if that zone trips the alarm. Under the restoral, they're zero zero or they're disabled. Zero one is enabled, zero zero is disabled. If you would like that event sent to central station, simply change the value to a zero one. And now for zone one's restoral, that signal will be sent to your central station. Another one to look at um, is system RCs. I'd like to point out that the system can do an automatic test of the communicator and you can set that up from anywhere from one day up to 255 days, particular time of day that you want the signal sent to your central station. And I want to make sure that the automatic test is set to zero one. Another one to, to look at is keypad panic RCs. Those are your function keys or your definable keys on your keypad. Right now, we have two keypads assigned to the system. We have two tabs now, KP1, KP2. The pulse value is zero, zero or disabled. I would like for those to send to central station and I can do the whole column at one time by, by right clicking on the pulse let me do it again, right click on the pulse and I can set the entire column to zero one without having to click on each individual uh, option there. Now everything that we've done so far from users down to communicator with the exception of assigning the voice description. The voice description for the zones can only be assigned through the through the software, the RP2 software. But everything else we could have done through the keypad programming. Everything's English text, it's spelled out for you, so it shouldn't have a, a, a minimal learning curve as far as the keypad programming. But I think you can see that the software is super intuitive, super easy to use, and where we really start setting the M1 system apart from other security systems is when we get into the automation. Now this is where you can create that life enhancement, that energy management, you can create those customized rules and so forth to, to meet the customer's needs and expectations. Under the rules and things, you can really get creative in some of the things that you're able to do. But before we get to rules, I want to touch on a couple of these other options here, the first of which is task. Now under the task, you have 32 tasks, which are just basically a name that you can assign to a set of rules later. Uh, it may be water the lawn or automate the uh, HVAC system or something like that. You give it a name. The show box here allows that name to show up on our keypad or the apps. There's a task uh, page on the apps as well that allows you to see those names. The voice description, if I'm calling into the system remotely, I can ac access the task menu and have that voice description that I can press pound to activate. So as far as the task, it's simply assigning a name at which point later on we'll write our rules. The lighting menu, uh, depending on the lighting technology or format that you go with, uh, we can support up to 256 devices. Now, of those devices, depending on the technology, the it may be individual loads from 1 to 192, and then the last 64 are scenes, groups, or links. That's depending on the manufacturing technology. That can vary a little bit, but for the most part, we have the option for a maximum of 256 devices, so to speak, in the, in the RP software. Outputs allows you to name the first 64 outputs in the list. After that, it's outputs 65 through 208. The sunrise sunset settings here, very important to make sure that you 
click a city near you or manually enter the latitude and longitude, select the correct time zone, calculate. That sets the parameters in the M1 so it knows approximately when it's sunrise and sunset in your area. Very important to make sure we get these set, especially if we're doing rules based upon when it is sunset, when it is sunrise, or if it's daylight or dark outside. The voice tab here, uh, for the most part, you most likely will not be uh, manipulating any of these, but especially the telephone control, because that could change things if you're trying to call into the system. Uh, it may not have the exact desired result that you want, so I would not but you can certainly go into some of the other menus and, and manipulate some of the voice descriptions that the M1 is speaking. Jump down to counters. We have uh, 64 counters and they count from one up to 65,535 or you can use a counter as a flag. Zero for off, one for on, and so forth. Or you can set up a free running counter that every time a zone is opened, it increments that counter. And when that counter equals 100, do something differently. Just a variety of things that you can do with counters. The thermostat tab allows you to name the thermostat. We can support up to 16 thermostats. The text menu here. This allows you to create custom messages that you can have displayed on the keypad. Maybe it's a, a birthday message, an anniversary, a holiday message. Uh, I would keep the messages short so they display on the, on the second line of the display. But then you can also, you can also uh, integrate with additional equipment that may not, we may not currently integrate with. If that piece of equipment has an RS-232 port, they have uh, their ASCII protocol so that we know what ASCII strings they're looking for. We can duplicate those ASCII strings in the M1 system here and through our M1XSP, our serial port expander, we can send and, send and receive those ASCII strings to that piece of equipment. Now, it, it wouldn't be full integration, but it may be enough to say, turn on the lights, turn on the pump, turn on the filter, um, turn on the fountain or, or something along those lines as long as we know what their ASCII protocol and we can duplicate those ASCII strings or you can create that custom message, uh, trash day, change the filter in the AC, change the filter in the refrigerator, those things that can be uh, displayed and scrolled across the M1 keypad. Now the last option here is the rules. Like I said, this is where you can really get creative in the things that you're able to do, customize, automate, and so forth. What are What is a rule in an M1 system? Well, a rule in the M1 system is a whenever and a then statement. The whenever is the trigger. That's what's going to start the process. We also have and statements, which help condition the rule even more to help uh, uh, only have it apply at certain times and so forth. And then the then statement. The then is the action that's going to take place. By definition, a single rule is one whenever and one then statement. You can have optional multiple and statements, which each and statement must be true before it will drop down to the next one. And then you can have multiple then statements within your rules. So what are some whenever statements? Well, time occurrence. We can have something happen at a specific time of the day, at sunrise or sunset, plus or minus a few minutes either way. Then very important to make sure our sunrise and sunset settings are correct. You can have something happen on the hour, on the minute, even every second could be a time occurrence type a trigger event. The zones changing state, when the zones become violated or bypassed, things of that nature. So if it's a non-alarm zone, for instance, that medicine cabinet, garage, or uh, uh, liquor cabinet and so forth, whenever that zone becomes not secure, I want to do these different things. Output changing state, when that output turns on or turns off, we can have a rule activated upon that event. The keypad F keys or those function keys, we can program them to do a variety of things, arm and disarm different areas, control lighting, 
uh, open the gate and so forth. The key fob buttons, that's the wireless key fobs. Remember button one and button two we set up for arm and disarm. Maybe button four, we're going to do the overhead garage door. We're going to write a rule that when the button four is pressed and momentarily close output three to simulate a garage door open and close. The light changing state, now that's dependent on the light itself being able to broadcast its status change. So that would be a function of the light that when you walk up and press that rocker switch, the light turns on It then broadcast, hey, I just turned on. The M1 could, could trigger upon that to do other things. The automation task, that remember we gave that task a name earlier, so now we can write the rules to control that task. The security aspect, probably one of the one of the biggest whenevers uh, that we're that we have is doing things based upon the system disarming or it arming or it goes into alarm, um, access and so forth. We can have whenevers based upon AC fail or low battery trouble conditions. Here is where we can send and receive those custom text messages, ASCII strings rather, those custom ASCII strings. If the, whenever the counter changes or expires, have it trigger that and have something happen. And then if the thermostat changes state, whether you know, somebody adjusts the thermostat, we want to know if it gets uh, set to heat mode or cool mode, we can have that as a whenever trigger event in the RP software. The ANDs are optional. You don't need them, but they're there to help condition the rule even more based upon the time of day is. Now that's specific to, relative to a specific time of day, relative to sunrise or sunset. The date, whether it's a specific day of the week, month or year. The light dark based upon those sunrise, sunset settings. Is the zone in a particular state? Is an output on off? Last user was. So if the last user was uh, little Susie, little Susie disarms the system, send, send her mom, uh, call her mom on the phone, send a text message, variety of things we can do based upon last user. Is the light in a particular state, in an on off state? Is the security system in an arm, disarm, or in an alarm state? Is there a specific trouble condition? Uh, look at the counters. Check the temperature on the keypad, the KP and KPB, or on the zone temperature sensor, or the thermostat itself. Look at those settings on the thermostat. And then finally, the then statement. So what are things that are going to happen? Well. Activate that automation task. Arm, disarm the system. Control the outputs, control the liking, lighting. Speak a message, send the custom text message out to, uh, to the keypads. You can enable and disable the chime. You can beep the keypads if you need that extra audible notification. Chirp the outside siren to let you know that the system armed or disarmed. Adjust the counters, dial the telephone number to speak a predefined voice message. With the XEP module, you have the capability of sending up to 16 predefined email messages. Adjust the thermostat, enable and disable users, enable and disable the voice capability of the M1, bypass and unbypass zones, even reset the smoke power from a rule. So a lot of different options there. Uh, one, I'll just give you a couple examples here real quick uh, on how easy it is to write the rule. I created the cleaning crew, user four, I believe it was earlier. Now, I only, I only want them to have access during certain times of the day or the week. So I'd start my rule off whenever time occurrence, time of day equals, and I'm gonna say 6 a.m., okay? And the date is specific days of the week, so that would be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, okay? Then I want to go to enable and disable user, and I'm going to enable the uh, cleaning crew. Now that rule is done. I click done, 
Now at some point I'm going to disable their code. So I new rule whenever and we'll go back to time occurrence time of day equals this time I'm going to select 5 p.m. Okay then go back to enable disable user and I'm going to disable user 4 in that case. And I don't really care about the days of the week because every day at 5 a.m. I'm going to disable that user. So user 4, the cleaning crew, only has access to my system after 6 a.m. on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday until 5 p.m. Another one, whenever, let's go to security slash alarms, whenever, let's do alarm turns on. So whenever the burglar alarm turns on in my area, main home then I want to dial telephone number I'm gonna dial my cell phone and I'm gonna select from the list on the message I want the M1 system to send me I know there is a burglar message so we got a lot of messages here we could speak there it is burglar message number one oh, I'm sorry fire message there we go all right, so when the system goes into alarm, it's going to call me. The system's going to say, please wait, please wait. It's going to deliver that burglary message, and then it's going to ask me to press pound to hang up. We could do a variety of other different things. Like I said, you got, you got so many different options there to select from as far as the way you create rules. You can set up that customization, that automation, that energy management and so forth. So like for instance, whenever the system arms to the away mode, turn the thermostat to a certain certain value and then uh, control the water shutoff valve and the electric hot water heater so that they turn off when the system is armed to the away mode. All right. Well, this, uh, this concludes uh, my presentation today. I certainly appreciate your time and attendance, and, and hopefully you got some good information about the Elk M1 system and the, and the RP2 software. If you have any questions, you please feel free to give us a call at 1-800-797-9355. You can ask for anyone in technical support. We'd be glad to assist you. We also have resources on our website. We have some pre-recorded webinars, as well as the M1 form and so forth. I uh, hope everyone has got some good information out of this. And like I said, I certainly do appreciate your time today. We look forward to working with you with an Elk M1 system.